All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for taking some time out today to, to join the webinar. And uh, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Mike Slotnick. And uh, he's gonna be talking about some insights that he can uh, give to us from his experience as a fund manager, um, talking about the different assets he analyzes and how he looks at uh, constructing a fund. So Mike, thanks a lot for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Clay. It's a privilege to be on the uh, webinar. Pleasure and a privilege. Let me put it this way. Thank you. <laughs> and Mike and I have known each other for several years, probably seven or eight. So um, we've done a, a couple of these before. But I was telling him earlier, every time I uh, uh, interact with him, I learn something new. So I'm looking forward to the webinar myself. Thank All you. Right, let's start off with a little bit of IRA stuff just to, to set the table. Of course, um, this is me. You can probably see me on the, the video as well, but uh, I have been in the business for about 10 years and I am an active self-directed IRA investor myself. And so I'm, I'm one of us, I'm, I'm one of you, one of us. Uh, we're all, all in this together, so to speak. So uh, do feel free to call me at any point or email me and uh, we can just talk strategy, talk me mechanics of accounts, uh, any of that kind of thing. Any question that you have lingering about your IRA strategy, I'm happy to help you with that. Uh, at any point, so feel free to reach out. All the information in the presentation today is gonna be for uh, education purposes only. In Advanced IRA, we do not give tax, legal, or investment advice. Uh, we don't advocate any particular investment, investment strategy, investment vendor. Uh, we are a very neutral part of the equation, in fact. Our role is really just to document the activity of the account in a way that's proper so that you get to keep the tax advantages. Um, but in terms of choosing assets or vetting them or any of that kind of stuff, that actually is on the shoulders of the account holder and your financial team. And we certainly encourage you to engage your financial team, whether that's your CPA, attorney, uh, family, any of those, uh, whenever you're considering an asset for your IRA uh, to invest in. So today's uh, presentation is for education and, and we hopefully we're going to get some some insights in terms of the way the pros do it. Uh, so looking forward to it. Now at Advanta, in terms of us being the custodian or the provider for the IRA, our focus is really customer service and one-on-one and -on -one customer interaction. Uh, we're an experienced group of folks, and I say that for a couple of reasons. One is we have over a billion dollars of assets under management, very long tenured, uh, and we do a lot of internal education as well. And the, the reason for that is that if everybody that you're interacting with at Advanta kind of knows the, the big picture, then the entire process flows better. So every account holder gets their, their own account manager. So you have a go-to person, you have their phone number and their email. So you know where to go to get information and the information is there. That doesn't mean you have to go to five people in the building. You go to your account manager and they can run the building uh, in service of whatever your request is. So. Uh, we try to make it as easy as possible for you to be able to manage your account. Uh, un undirected cash is FDIC insured, as you see there. And, you know, as I say, as a company that's a, a bit of a medium size in our space, I feel like the nice thing is we've, we've seen everything, uh, all kinds of asset classes and all kinds of um, eventualities. But we're also, so we're big enough to have seen everything, but we're also small enough to, again, keep that uh, personal touch and personal interaction with the account holders. Now, I'm just gonna give a brief overview of self-directed IRAs. We, uh, hopefully you kind of understand that your IRA can invest in uh, funds like this and, and all kinds of private investments. So the idea is that you're combining these accounts and the account types uh, are the ones that you're familiar with. Now, all these account types can be self-directed. Self-directed is not a different account type. So your self-directed account with us will be a traditional or a Roth, maybe an HSA. A lot of people don't know that HSAs can invest the same way as IRAs. Uh, so that is absolutely possible. Lots of people use their old former employer plans. So if you've separated from employment at an employer, that 401k plan becomes uh, mobile, so to speak, which means that you can roll it over without tax and without penalty to a, 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 an IRA custodian and then invest from there. So a lot of people are using that money um, to invest in funds as well. We do simple IRAs, SEP IRAs, solo 401ks. For, uh, so uh, SEP IRAs and solo 401ks in particular for self-employed folks. And then we also do education savings accounts. So all of these account types can be self-directed and can invest in these private assets. 
and the private assets are these kinds of things. So there's real estate, there's all kinds of real estate, frankly, that's such a broad asset category, but residential, commercial, uh, tax liens, private equity, we're talking a little bit about that today in terms of the fund. Um, funds can obviously be equity or debt, but today we're gonna be talking about uh, equity. Uh, precious metals, so every, every, you guys may have seen that uh, uh, gold and silver are going up quite a bit recently, so that's uh, generating some more interest in that. Um, but there's other things too, oil and gas, mineral rights, uh, agriculture. In fact, almost anything that you know how to make money at outside of your IRA, you can make money at inside your IRA. It's just a matter of having a custodian that handles those asset classes. And at advance, we, we handle almost everything that is allowed by law. So just bring us your idea and we will uh, help you to achieve that, that strategy. Now, there are a few things that you'll need to know about IRA investing in funds. And this is actually a little bit broader than that. So there are some investments that are prohibited. That's collectibles and life insurance. There are some things that are prohibited in terms of transactions. So for instance, you cannot, your IRA can't buy something that you already own. Your IRA cannot buy into a fund that you own or control. Um, things like that. So there are some disqualified persons that you see there on the right. That's your lineal ascendants and descendants. Um, those disqualified persons have some restrictions in terms of the way that they interact with the IRA's cash and assets. Uh, if you have any questions about any of that stuff, please feel free to call us. In the case of investing in a fund, this, the prohibited transactions come up relatively infrequently. Um, you're usually uh, choosing a fund and then you do the due diligence and then make your decision on whether to invest in it or not. Usually, and usually the person who is investing is not uh, intimately connected with the fund, so, um, so usually not too much worry about prohibited transactions. When you're thinking about private funds, there are some things to, to just kind of think about. So first of all, a fund can be almost any strategy. It can be real estate based or other. Uh, and certainly talking to the, the fund manager or the person that is telling you about the fund to find out what the strategy is, how it's gonna make money. Obviously, that's a key part of the equation. It can be anything from a small syndication to a large and diversified fund. Some funds require uh, investors to be accredited, some don't, some are a mixture. So asking about that criteria is often important in terms of your investment. Um, level of transparency, you know, different funds report back to their investors in different ways. So that's another, you know, especially for somebody who wants to keep track of what's happening and being uh, you know, informed about their investment. Transparency may be a big deal for you in terms of choosing a fund. And then the timing and re of returns. Now, obviously you want to get a great return, but you know, timing also comes into play too. Does it come back in one lump sum after several years? Is it dividends that are periodic, things like that. So that timing of the return has to coincide with your financial world as well. So these are just some of the criteria that you would probably think about in terms of choosing a fund. And obviously today we have Mike on hand, so we're gonna be able to <laughs> grill him a little bit if we want to uh, about how things, how that kind of thing goes. Um, it's a very easy process. You know, open up an IRA with us, takes about 15 minutes on the application. It takes about a day to open the account. Uh, then you move some money into it. Do that via transfer, rollover, or contribution, or some combination of those things. And then you're ready to start investing. So any of the investment strategies that you have in mind, Talk to us about it ahead of time. We'll give you the map of how it goes, but you can get started on an IRA investment strategy relatively quickly. So please feel free to take advantage of that. The last thing I'll just mention today, and here's our contact information, and we're gonna come back to this uh, at the Q&A uh, part of the presentation. So Mike, I'm just about to turn it over to you. Um, but I will say that for those of you who are attending, you know, please feel free to ask questions and go ahead and write them into the uh, questions box on your console. We're going to get to them at the end. It can be an IRA question or a question for Mike. Um, happy to go ahead and have that uh, conversation with you about something specific. So please do feel free to start typing your questions in at any time that they occur to you, and uh, we will take them at the end of the uh, presentation. So Mike, I see your screen is up and you have control. Uh, so everybody, I'd like to introduce Mike Slotnick. Uh, and I, you've probably read his bio on the, uh, the webinar uh, promo, but I will just say that again, I, I've known Mike for several years and, and always valued his uh, opinion uh, in terms of 
he's always been very willing to to talk about what's going on behind the scenes and how he analyzes things. So, Mike, if you don't mind, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Clay. Appreciate the introduction and uh, appreciate our relationship. Yeah, we've been uh, this uh, for a number of years. I don't even remember when we started, but I think it's at least six, seven years. That's just my guess. Um, let me get started somehow on my screen. I'm just being blocked by the, uh, I'm gonna minimize this, okay. So this presentation is obviously for educational purposes only. I'll read disclaimer. Uh, it's focused on building a diversified fund or portfolio. So when you build your own portfolio, it's the same process as building a fund. We, I do the same exercise as a fund manager. So this will give you a little bit of an insight in, into our uh, most recent fund, Tempo Growth Fund, and how it's built. And then I'll talk a little bit about the COVID environment. All that is extremely dynamic and changing, but uh, we'll, we'll chat a little bit about that, sort of current uh, market conditions and how they're impacting our thinking and strategy. So let me, uh, now I need to be able to move this to the next screen. Okay. So disclaim educational purposes only. We are not giving any kind of advice at all. Uh, please consult with your CPA, attorney, and whoever else you need to. Um, we are in our private lending business and fund management business. All our funds are offered through private place and memorandum to accredit investors only. Past results don't guarantee future and performance. There are some conflicts of interest. Information here is a proxy with the nation, in nature and things can be different. Just a couple of words about me. I'm known as the Big Mike. I didn't come up with a name. Um, it was given to me by the uh, one of the mastermind groups I go to. And I'm, a, I'm a tall 6'4", and um, you know a little bit you know big. So <laughs> stuck the name Big Mike. So I'm, uh, I live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, married, uh, four kids and a cat, and um, uh, I manage a, a family of funds. I had a previous career in software development, enjoyed that, but my passion has always been real estate. And I went real estate full-time in 2009, been real estate investor since 2000. Uh, we do have certain areas of specialty, uh, bridge lending, hard money lending is one of these areas, and then um, long-term equity investments focused on um, predictable cash flow and value-driven appreciation. The fund we're gonna talk about today, Tempo Growth Fund, is all about growth, uh, so it's heavily composed of value-add uh, projects in, in various sectors. Um, I published a book, uh, if you're interested, that's available on Amazon um, in um, uh, the Kindle format uh, and, and physical copies, and I run a podcast called uh, Big Mike Fund Podcast. Couldn't come up with a more creative name, seriously, um, and it's... Uh, just the name stuck, and, and that's why it's called. Uh, it is available at bigmikefund.com. You're welcome to, when you're bored, you got nothing else to do, feel free to listen to it. Business philosophy, just a couple of words. Um, we like to think, follow the, the, the kind of the, the leadership of Warren Buffett. He's the ultimate uh, godfather of the value investing. Actually, Benjamin Graham is the godfather. He Warren Buffett, I guess, is the father of value investing. And uh, what he does, uh, it's all about only three things. Whenever you make an investment decision, you're thinking really only about three things, people, projects, and dollars. So for him, people, companies, and dollars. Same thing for us. We always think, we always identify the people who we want to invest uh, with. As a fund manager, we invest in projects. And there is a an operator, a project sponsor, uh, somebody who's running the project. We are, uh, as a fund manager, my job is to identify investments, make investments, monitor, but we don't run, we don't actively operate these buildings, sell storage facilities or multifamily and, and so on. So selecting the people is the most critical element of investing. Always start with a person. If we know, like, and trust them, those are key words. You have to know, like, and trust them. And it's not easy to build the trust, but once you get there, you can make the investments. The second component is uh, investments themselves. We have to underwrite them. And uh, at times I speak with very competent operators who find the deal that's so-so and they would like to do the deal. And my job is to give them feedback uh, uh, that this deal needs a little improvement, a little negotiation. So we don't just try to invest, we try to improve the deals, get get them to be better projects. Sometimes we can, we can do it, sometimes just walk away. You always have to be ready to walk away uh, if you don't like something. 
and then decide how much capital invest. That has to fall as part of your diversification strategy or our diversification strategy. So again, for us, everything is relationship driven. We don't take call, we don't take any cold business from the street. When people call us, oh, I got a project, wonderful. Who referred you? Oh, I heard you, I saw I found I found you on the internet. Wonderful. Have a nice day. I appreciate your time. So that's simple. We we only work with people who uh, were referred to us uh, or we uh, one of our existing uh, relationship or a strong referral. Diversification can't stress this enough. It's one of the most important things you can do is to build a diversified portfolio. Now, some investments are diversified, some not. So you have to dig in into what you're investing to, to make sure that you're building diversified portfolio rather than overloaded portfolio in something, you know, one sector. And it, it's... Um, COVID have shown what uh, lack of diversification can do if you invested in hospitality or retail. You would you would have taken it on on the chin on the on the chin in a big way if you're not diversified. So that's that's the reason why diversification cannot be understated. And you can diversify among many dimensions: equity, debt, location, deal type, operator, and so on. When we uh, approach uh, investing from our um, uh, perspective. We always put investors first, first, and our fund uh, waterfall, and I'll explain what a fall is. Is a very institutional level, very professional, uh, compensating investors uh, significantly more than the managers. We get paid. Don't get me the wrong way. We need to keep the lights on, uh, but it is important to make sure investors are taken well, uh, well taken care of. Just a couple of words about Temp Tempo Grow Fund. Just to give you an overview of what the fund is. Once you understand what the fund is, it'll be easier to see how we build the portfolio. So it's a um, closed-ended fund. We're raising $25 million for this fund. Um, it's closed-ended growth focused. So growth means that we are not concerned with immediate income. We're concerned with uh, ultimate risk-adjusted return. And these are the words we use again and again, risk-adjusted. And we'll talk more about it. So we, we we need to put the money to work for five years and get the best return. If there's cash flow, great. If there is no cash flow, we're not going to be stressed about it. It's a growth fund. And as Clay mentioned, it has to match your objective. Uh, we have many IRA investors in the fund, but at the same time, they're all very patient. If you're an IRA investor who needs income, this is not a good match for you. If you need an income today, but if you need the income in six, seven years from now, that may be a good consideration because the fund generates growth of your money, not immediate income, just for clarification. And again, we're focused on strong risk adjusted return. It's tax efficient, um, uh, five to seven year time horizon on the fund. It is IRA friendly. We have zero leverage on a fund level. So um, there's a technical risk if you invest in a leverage deal with your IRA money. It can create UDFI, unrelated debt finance income tax, ta tax. Another word for it is UBIT. So that's the reason we don't have uh, leverage is we don't want IRA investors to be a, at risk of the UBIT tax. The other reason for no, no leverage, leverage works both ways. So having non-leveraged fund is safer. If we could generate good return without leverage, so much more power to it. Um, the fund has 8% preferred return and then 80-20 split above 8 to Class A members and 70-30 split above 8% uh, to Class B members. That's the waterfall. And generally, people spe speaking, people ask me, so what is the, the total return? Well, generally, it's 8% PREF plus the performance split. I'll cover it later in the presentation. Uh, we do have a target return, but it's a combination of the PREF plus the performance split above that. That creates a total return. Uh, we're raising the capital for 12 months. We're allowed two six months extensions. Just a high level overview of what the fund looks like. Let me start in another place. So another place is before you do anything, you should have a plan. You should have goals in life. If you don't have goals, where are you going? Same thing is true on a fund level. You got to have some goals uh, in your investment strategy. You invest in your IRA money, well, you got goals. And uh, uh, once you have goals, you could build your allocation model. And we'll talk a little bit about investment quadrants. It's an educational methodology that helps um, us see where we're going. You're welcome to use the methodology. It's a fairly simple methodology. So allocation model um, helps. And then you use building blocks. The building blocks in real estate are pretty much four building blocks. You have funds, you have syndications, you have partnerships, and you have individual deals. So your portfolio should be composed of a bunch of building blocks. 
Uh, generally, funds are on the bottom, your foundation, and then you can take a little bit more risk with syndication or, or, uh, or individual deals or partnerships. And you can focus your portfolio on something that you like. If you like a particular sponsor, you like a particular sector, you like a particular location, you can take a bigger position in that. The funds generally give you diversification and foundation, um, so you spread the risk. But once you have uh, enough foundation, you could you could build whatever you like if you have a plan. And obviously, you have to monitor and adjust. So some of the portfolio goals, very, very important. Um, I, I think you have to start with uh, your own risk tolerance, risk reward tolerance. If you can't take the risk, don't invest into risky things. You're better with something safe, gives you lower rate of return, but you can sleep well at night. So risk reward tolerance and your goals in that are very, very important. Your cash flow goals, if you have, uh, if you are in the retirement age and you need cash flow, that's a goal. If you have five, six, seven years to retirement and you're trying to grow your IRA, that's a goal. That's a growth is your goal. And what's your total return? So um, we'll cover this, but total return is a combination of a cash flow and growth. So depending on your needs, if you need to retire with a certain amount of net worth, uh, you may want to build a uh, total return uh, goal. Uh, it has to be realistic. You really have to be smart about it. You could, you could write a great goal of 30% of your return. Is it realistic? No. But if you write a, a goal uh, 10, 12%, and you 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 have the right people to invest with it's very achievable so, so just to give you some real basics tax efficiency iras don't have to worry about it um but if you're investing non-ira money it's a consideration obviously uh, for iras as i mentioned the only concern is you bid risk so if you don't want to pay taxes on your income in an ira make sure your investment should, should not be at the risk of the UBIT. Diversification, probably the most important goal, how diversified you want to be, uh, because that spreads risks that creates smooth sailing instead of roller coaster ride. Time horizon, how, how long you're investing for, and then liquidity. Do you uh, have do you need access to liquid investments or not? Uh, and it, it's 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 important. If you if you need cash, you're in your retirement age and you don't want to put your money for long term if you see you're gonna need access to you know big distribution. So Tempo Growth Fund goals, um, we're focused on maximizing risk-adjusted return. Uh, we're not uh, as concerned on cash flow, as I mentioned. Um, but if we have it, great. It's an added bonus. Total return on a fund level, we're focusing on 18% plus. Um, and the reason for this is we, uh, we invest in value-add projects. Uh, we believe that with the right sponsors, with the right value-add strategy, it's very achievable. So that's, uh, that's our goal on average. Tax efficiency uh, for us is not required. Um, IRAs don't care. Some non-IRAs, non-qualified money do care about depreciation. The fund will have depreciation and passes it through. IRAs don't care. Those who can use it, use it. Uh, diversification goal. So we're trying to build a portfolio of 20 to 30 assets. There is no right or wrong number. Uh, we could uh, overload when we invest into other funds. So we are sort of a fund of funds. We invest in syndications, funds, individual deals, and so on. Um, so 20 to 30 assets is a good target with a maximum 10% per asset. We don't want to be overexposed to anything. Time horizon, five to seven years, liquidity low. We don't really care to be liquid because we're not investing. Uh, there is no redemption mechanism. When you go in this fund, uh, and by the way, it's not just us. Uh, most of the closed ended funds invest in a finite real estate project, meaning that there is an acquisition, there is an value add, and then there is an exit, uh, and it takes years. Until there is an exit, uh, there is no liquidity. You you will get distributions, but you will not get uh, an ability. You can you can't redeem your investment. Uh, closed ended funds generally don't have the redemption mechanism. So fund manager's job number one, that's my favorite slide in the whole presentation. So I live in Brooklyn, New York. We have a wonderful, scariest, oldest wooden roller coaster in the United States. It's called the Cyclone. It's old, it's, I think it's 100 years old now. This picture says 85, but it's it's over 100 years old. Um, it's not fun for me to ride. Uh, some people enjoy it. If you like this kind of stuff, enjoy but I prefer smooth sailing. So smooth sailing is accomplished by a well-diversified strategy, well-understood risk. So that's the job number one. Again, COVID, why diversify? I, I already mentioned this. Uh, it's pretty obvious what happens when you have a non-diversified portfolio and there is a significant dislocation in the market. 
caused by COVID or caused by some kind of a local market distortion or a sector-driven distortion. So COVID broke a few sectors, hospitality, retail, some office and so on. There are occasionally localized events. If you're not diversified, you could have a local problem, local economy could sink. That's why diversify, diversification among many dimensions is, is very, very important. So um, when you build a portfolio goals, you got to have uh, your end game in mind. The end game is we're trying to get to 25 million portfolio. So when we build building blocks, they want they are of certain size matching the total objective. And uh, if you uh, start diversifying and you have a very small amount of money today, but you, you know you're going to have more money in the future, you should be planning to include that money. If, if you're not planning for that, you, you, you'll be building diversification a much smaller pool of money. Uh, why it's important? Because you need to have the right size investments and the right size investments has to match the objective. So for us, 25 million, we're building it in, into sub blocks. Uh, if we knew we could only raise 10 million, the block sizes would be smaller. But we're fairly comfortable with this, so we we're proceeding with this plan. We like distress and discounted uh, commercial debt. Um, uh, the words distress and discounted could be scary to somebody. To us, it's music. It means there's a problem with the, with the, with the mortgage. We are buying first in mortgage, and we can get into this at a good price, at a conservative valuation, and get into a deal very defensively at the low investment to value ratio. I'll give you an example of a deal in a minute. So we like the space because we're in a senior on a capital stack, firstly in paper. We want to put about 20% of the fund in that sector. It's a very defensive sector in general. If you can acquire good paper, uh, the reason we like distress and default at overperforming is because the interest rate is much higher. Default interest rate uh, the, on the deals that we invest in is generally 24%. 18 to 24% range versus performing paper could be 10%. I would rather accrue 24% than get paid 10. So that, that's the basic premise uh, why invest in these type of deals. Value add multifamily, again, about 20% of the fund. Value add self storage. Uh, both sectors are fairly defensive. People need to live somewhere. And you you got to pick and choose the right assets, obviously. Uh, but if we hit recession, self storage generally does well in recession and people need to live. Uh, housing does better than some aggressive sectors. What is a, at a higher risk, and we're already seeing the, the impact, hospitality, retail, people cut on their travel, people uh, uh, people spend uh, less money, it, it, it's, it, and shopping has completely shifted. Well, it's still brick and mortar, but COVID broke the sector permanently. There's heavy uh, shift into e-commerce, Amazon effect and so on. Now there will be a recovery and number of brick and mortar businesses will come back, but many will not. So the point that I'm making is we're trying to focus on the sectors we feel should do well from here. Um, it becomes very hard to pick winners and losers uh, in, in, in hospitality. We like hospitality as a conversion to affordable housing, but invest in a hotel now and hope and pray that it'll recover and people come back a couple of years from now is very speculative. If that hotel can be converted to affordable housing, it's a very different, um, people need to live somewhere. And affordable housing is, is short in virtually every city in the United States. So just a strategy. We're open to some industrial conversions, development, redevelopment deals, opportunistic, and have some flexibility. And you can have the same with your portfolio. So if you're building your portfolio, an example with you know $2 million objective, uh, you, you could build building blocks proportionate size and, and write uh, pro uh, appropriate checks. So um, need some basic rules. When you're building a portfolio, you absolutely want to limit your exposure to anything. So a maximum exposure to anything should not be more than 10%. So if $25 million fund, it's $2.5 million maximum exposure. Number of assets, um, 20 to 30 assets should be good. Uh, there's no right or wrong. You could go with 40, 50, you can go with more. Then you're spending more time managing a, 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 a lot of smaller investments. You could do that, it's just more and more work. Uh, if you have fewer assets, you have too much concentration. And that's why we feel this is a good theory. And the theory does follow what uh, many fund managers do on Wall Street. Um, 20 to 30 uh, well-diversified investments uh, 
is plenty, 24% of the fund going into uh, a typical investment. Maximum exposure to sponsor, another ground rule. So we, 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 even though we may have a great sponsor and we may be willing to do a lot of projects with that sponsor, we still need to limit. What if he gets hit by a bus or something happens to that sector? That's why uh, you gotta have that maximum exposure. 20% uh, is, is what we use. Uh, similarly, for any asset class, you gotta have maximum exposure. Uh, in other words, if, um, uh, let's say, say we were pre-COVID and we use a strategy and we got into some hotels, we would be in difficult position now, but we would still not be uh, losing our shirt because we would have lim limited exposure. We would limit to 20%. The same is true going forward. Make sure you limit your exposure to everything. And then um, we have preferred investments, quadrant two deals. In a second, we'll talk about the quadrants. Um, these are uh, deals with good downside protections and, and the growth projects. We like firstly in distress mortgages. Um, quadrant four deals, quadrant four in a minute you'll see it's more speculative quadrant, uh, but there are projects that have higher risk adjusted return and willing to take the risk because they make sense. So we're willing to speculate a little bit. So again, quadrant four preferred, quadrant, uh, I'm sorry, quadrant two preferred and quadrant four is possible. Um, so now let's talk about quadrants. Let me just give you a quick overview of investment quadrants. This is a basic educational methodology to help um, you, me, anybody to see what, uh, what they're investing into. Where does it belong? So it's built on very simple uh, concepts. Number one, um, it's a risk profile. So investments that have lower level of risk, uh, we call them investment grade. And generally speaking, the number one characteristic of investment grade um, uh, investments is good downside protection. It needs to be well understood and, 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 and well agreed to. So uh, I'll give you examples of quadrant uh, one and two deals in a second. So again, quadrant one and two investment grade, more defensive, and then quadrant three and four speculative grade. They, they are riskier projects, limited downside protection. You could lose your shirt. Uh, you, could, you could lose all your money in these investments. Typically in quadrant one and two, you could take a little bit of a haircut. It can happen in a really bad project, but you should not lose all your money most of the time. Quadrant three and four, very speculative. Quadrant one and three are focused on income, on, on cash flow. And quadrant two and four focused on growth. So here's some examples, quadrant one deals. First lien mortgages, you invest in a note secured by a first lien mortgage or a deed of trust at a conservative investment to value ratio or loan to value ratio. You, you feel pretty safe and that's a quadrant one deal. It generates cash flow, it's a performing loan and it's a defensive in nature. Another example of a quadrant one deal would be a moderately leveraged uh, syndication, a uh, multifamily deal where there's strong cash flow there's a very good mortgage, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, cheap financing at a low interest rate, maybe with exposure at 70%. Sometimes you, you, allow, you could allow them to go to 75%, but there is a strong coverage, what is known as a debt service coverage ratio. In other words, the cash flows are such that even if uh, vacancy increases, they can service the debt and they can manage the project. So those projects can fall into quadrant one. Quadrant two examples, um, simple common example, distressed commercial debt. So mortgage, you're buying a first lien mortgage, non-performing note at 50% LTV loan to value ratio or ITV investment to value ratio. So you're secured by twice as much value as your loan. It's not performing, so you're not collecting any, any cash flow. That's why it's a growth project, but it's a very defensive because of that safety of that first lien mortgage. Uh, another example of a quadrant two is, is uh, similar to the previous uh, deal I mentioned, multifamily with a cash flow, but there's a value add component. And the value add component is reducing the cash flow, but the units are going through renovation. So maybe break even cash flow, as long as it's not losing money, many of these projects could still fall into quadrant two deal. Uh, quadrant three deals are much more speculative. So examples of quadrant three deals could be highly leveraged syndications. They generate good cash flow, but they are they are leverage. Or second lien mortgages. If you invested in a junior lien, junior uh, deed of trust, uh, you're in a second position. You may be getting great cash flow, but you are not in first position. And if 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 the borrower defaults, your money is at risk. 
Quadrant four are all your spe speculation deals, your development, your redevelopment, land speculation, anything that has to do with uh, heavy growth. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it is what it is. We're just calling them quadrant four because they're speculative projects. You're building a ground up anything or redeveloping anything. It is speculative. You could have failures related to, to construction. And so you could, uh, cost overruns, delays, regulation, so on and so forth. So and now you see also the the blue and the and the and, and the uh, and the yellow, the target return, sort of the average ROI and the risk adjusted ROI. This is a very important methodology, and these numbers are approximate in nature. Uh, they represent what we uh, see on average uh, in our world, but they change. They change in market conditions. In a COVID environment, the, number, the numbers could be lower or higher depending on how you, you you what projects you invest in. But the point is, there is a range, sort of your average uh, range on the projects that would. Um, if there was no risk, that, that's what they would generate. So we, we, we do see projects in quadrant one in 10 to 15% range, projects uh, quadrant two, 12 to 18, and so on and so forth. But we always adjust them for risk. So quadrant one and two, the risk adjustment is generally one or one to 2% because these projects are fairly defensive in nature and the risk is not that high. So we, we reduce the projected target ROI by one or 2% to get risk adjusted ROI. Quadrant three and four is very different. The risk is much, much higher and you have to adjust for risk quite a bit more. And that's why you, you would see the risk adjustment is 6% at times it's eight, 10 and even higher. Some projects can promise you great numbers but the risk is so high that the risk adjusted number could be negative. Uh, so you have to be pretty smart and pretty careful about understanding the risk and adjusting for risk when you're setting expectations. What happens uh, on many of these deals, uh, the the internet is a great marketing platform. There are a lot of promotions out there, and they use what is known as a pro forma. Pro forma is a technical term, but it's projected number. They tell you you're going to get 25% projected. You're going to get 20% projected. These are wonderful numbers, but do they advertise risk? No. You have to determine the risk. So if you not adjust for risk, and the project is highly speculative. You're taking a lot of risk it could fail just as just as well as could generate you that promote, proposed return see so that's a very important um consideration when we invest in quadrant four deals we adjust for risk if we think we generate going to generate 25 percent uh on that project um and the risk factor is 10 percent well our risk adjusted is 15. and uh the other important consideration is that you have to be compensated with a higher risk adjusted return by going into uh, speculative projects versus investment grade. Why? Because if, you, if you're if you taking more risk, you need to, if you're not making a higher rate of return, why are you doing this? It's really, really important. The same, by the way, is true when you're shifting from uh, left quadrants to the right quadrants. If you're taking uh, on growth projects versus the cash flow generating projects, you're deferring cash, so you better be getting compensated better for, for that um, deferral. So again, your returns should be gravitating from left to right and from um, top to bottom. Um, but again, it's your own risk profile. We're comfortable a lot with quadrant two, a little bit in quadrant four. You can make your own decisions. Again, let me keep running forward. I know I'm a little bit slow here, but I'll, I'll, I'll accelerate from here. So current portfolio. This is how we run the fund, full transparency. We're showing what's in the fund. It's sort of like a, a white box. You could see what's going on. Some funds run themselves as a black box. You have no idea what's going on. We are very transparent. We communicate to investors on a quarterly basis. And as Clay mentioned, this is very important. It's a confidence builder. What I hate to do is when we invest and the communications are poor and I don't know what's going on, it's going to drive you nuts. It drives me nuts. That's why I think transparency is very important, good communications. So we have a few investments in the fund. I just, just showed you um, a kind of internal, uh, you know, it, it follows the plan, but what I'm showing you what's in the fund today. So we invested half a million dollars in the value at uh, apartments in Indianapolis. We invested a million bucks with Eric Goodman in the Goodman Fund too, which is distressed commercial debt fund here in New York City. Uh, we invested a million bucks in a value at self storage fund with Fairway America, class A units in both funds. Uh, it's another benefit of investing through a fund like ours. You can go to 
uh, Eric Goodman directly or Fairway and make investment too. But they have minimum investments, typically a million dollars to get into class A units. So if you're not able to write the check, uh, you at times can can do better by investing through us because we uh, elevate the access point, we participate in the high units of other funds, and then we diversify at the same time. Uh, we invested in Armada Conversion, half a million dollars to an affordable housing in Mesa, Arizona. And uh, we invested a larger than the max uh, amount in, in another value at apartment complex, but we are backfilling and selling off down to half a million, $10 million. The project was so good, we took a bigger piece and there's a serious demand on it where we're sort of uh, selling it off to uh, individual investors because we like the project. Uh, we, we love the project, we just can't have that exposure that great, um, even the project is, is very strong. So in, in Q, sorry, H2, second half of the year, we're looking to invest more money in distressed commercial debt, value at multifamily, value at self-storage, and now we're repositioning of an old hotels to affordable housing. That seems to be a trend. We haven't figured out what to do with old shopping plazas, uh, other than conversions to self-storage. Uh, but with hotels, uh, th there's a conversion path to affordable housing. Distressed commercial debt, so here's an example. Uh, this is a deal that uh, Goodman Capital Fund 2 uh, acquired in May. We're in that fund. The fund is closed at this point. Closed in January, we participate in the deal in the fund. But this deal is their deal. It's not our deal. We didn't invest in the deal directly. It's the deal of a Goodman Capital Fund 2. So they acquired a note of 7.1 million. Uh, it's right here, a purchase price. The note was already in default and distress and, and had uh, an immediate payoff of 7.7. .7 4 million. So there's an immediate bump acquiring the note. And the reason uh, there was a bump, it comes from a late charge. You default on a loan, there's an immediate 5% late charge. And there is some default interest, which is 24%. It has accrued uh, from the technical default of uh, December uh, 1st. So when you acquire uh, a default note like this, you have to look at the collateral. The collateral here is a great asset. It's less than a block from Central Park in Manhattan on East ADA Street, it's a prize asset, and it is a um, townhouse, they don't build them anymore. So the supply is limited. Even though uh, there are, New York City has been hit hard by, by the virus, a number of other issues, the city is, is still a great place to live. Many people love to have assets in a location like this. And this, this is a unique asset, which I feel uh, it has strong downside protection because they don't build them anymore. Uh, so, uh, that's the uh, that's the collateral, and then the loan safety is 7.1 uh, purchase price over valuation of at least 15 million dollars. This is easily worth 15, probably higher. So loan to value ratio or investment to value ratio is less than 50 percent. So all those things create safety of the investment. We love this type of deals. They're very defensive. We're clocking default interest, and for a risk adjusted, we wrote the return to be 16 percent plus on this investment. We feel pretty good about that. Okay, even if it's not 16, it's 15. It's still very defensive, still meets our criteria, um, and we will do these all day long. So, value at multifamily. So here's a very straightforward picture, picture what value at projects uh, look like. Uh, it's an acquisition of an, um, uh, somewhat older assets, late 80s, that needs renovation, uh, improve the curb appeal, external roofs, siding, and then internal uh, units changing to stainless steel appliances, some redesign internally to modern, um, better cabinets, flooring. When you combine all those things together, it significantly improves uh, the value of the property and increases rents. And the rent increases on these value add projects could be significant. Uh, from you know, from 20 to, uh, to 30% is very common, at times even higher, depending on the value add strategy. So uh, typically value add work year one and two, sometimes it gets spilled into year three, then there is a year three refi, return of some capital. And then the, the remaining money generates pretty pretty strong cash on cash yield. And there could be an exit point, say year five. So we like these projects, very straightforward story. And we invest with very, very competent operators, which is a critical element. Um, and then on a project like this, we could generate to the fund 20% plus internal rate of return. IRR stands for internal rate of return. It's sort of a compounded uh, annualized ROI commonly used in commercial projects. Uh, you, you will hear every annual uh, return or IRR, but they, they're a little bit different. I like IRR, it represents a better rate of return. So an example would be, 
if you're given an IRR of 20%, an equivalent of average annual return would be, say, 23%. It's just IRR has a better math behind it because it, it, it compounds, it computes in compounding or when, or when the cash is distributed. Next deal, we invested into another fund. It's, it's a closed-ended fund. We pledged a million bucks. We wrote an initial check for approximately 360,000. We work closely with Fairway America. Uh, they're a very competent uh, organization. Um, we uh, like working with them quite a bit and they had a diversified self-storage fund. And um, to get into class A units, we had to write at least a million dollar check or a pledge. And we did that. We in the fund projected target return is uh, very high teens, 19 and a half to 20. And all the, uh, the fund invests in is just a set of value-add projects in self-storage. Well, what does that mean? Well, in self-storage, value-add could be conversions of an old Macy's, old JCPenney, old Sears to self-storage. Very, very common practice, has been a trend for a number of years, and will continue with dysfunctional malls. Uh, so could be ground up construction, which is rare now, more likely conversion uh, of an old uh, buildings dysfunctional into uh, self-storage. We like this sector. It's a steady eddy. Typically no tenants and toilets. Foreclosures are easy. There's no foreclosure. They, basically people don't pay. So you don't have to foreclose. You don't have to evict them. You just lock up the units and, you know, if they want the, the, the junk back, uh, they got to pay. Otherwise you're going to auction it 60 days later. So from that perspective, no eviction, no tenants and toilets, um, easy to operate, easy to run, a lot of computerized and uh, uh, internet-driven uh, marketing and subscriptions. The uh, institutional level facility is over 60,000 square feet, very, very powerful. Um, lots of REITs love to buy them. So exit point on these projects, you could go redevelop and the REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust, will come in and buy it from you at a premium. Ramada conversion to affordable housing, uh, very much like the concept uh, as um, COVID has devastated uh, the, house, the hotel industry. These projects are happening today and more and more will happen in the future. So uh, the simple uh, methodology is acquire an old hotel at a well below reconstruction cost and then renovate it into affordable units. Now, not everybody wants to live in a studio. These units are small. But there are plenty of people who like this and they need this and they, they, they don't need one bedroom, they're pretty happy with a studio, a student, a, uh, you know, a single person, maybe even a couple who's comfortable with the, with the small living conditions. And the demand is pretty good, affordability is the key. This particular project has a proximity very close to the light rail stop, which, which helps with transportation and it's in downtown Mesa, Arizona. Riverbend Apartments, uh, this is the recent deal where we wrote $3 million check. Uh, we are backfilling, we're almost done backfilling the, the project. So we're basically backfilling about two and a half, keeping half a million dollars in this project. It's a strong deal, has internal rate of return in the mid 20s on a five year hold. Uh, very experienced sponsor, we know them really well. They're innovating in turn. It needs about three years to renovate in turn. In other words, as people vacate, typical vacancy 8%, 7%. So that's as much as you can do per quarter, not more. So renovations in turn is a um, uh, is a defensive strategy. You're, you're keeping occupancy high and you're just renovating the units that are vacant. Internal renovations go at that pace. External, you can do a whole lot faster. Uh, and the whole premise uh, is take renovation, take the rents below $800 per door in an aged asset, uh, improve the asset and easily increase it to over $1,000 a door. This property is in a great area and the new construction uh, rents are much, much higher. So this becomes a very affordable alternative and it should work really well in, in the recessionary environment as people gravitate to affordability. Renovated asset at a, at a, at a better rent than a new asset um, at a higher rent, um, most people will, 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 will will choose the renovated and save during a recessionary environment. So we feel pretty good about it. The project has a cash flow added bonus. We weren't we weren't planning for it, but the fact that it has it, it uh, actually helps. Extra ca cash cash doesn't hurt. Let me put it this way: on growth projects, it sort of puts a little bit of color on otherwise uh, something that feels like it's got no cash flow. And this project has massive accelerated depreciation. 
uh, due to a segregation study. A uh, segregation study is a study typically used on apartment complexes and other commercial deals where a CPA comes in and does a study how many doors they got and how many windows they got and they start depreciating those assets a lot faster than the building the bricks sort of. Uh, so accelerated depreciation enables uh, accelerated write-off. It doesn't help IRA accounts at all, but it does help um, investors that that they need it. And, and there are a couple of use cases. If they're real estate professionals, they can deduct against their other income. Or if they sold an appreciated asset, they have passive investment gains. They have capital gains or they have passive income from other properties. This helps reduce tax liabilities. Again, uh, not applicable to RERAs. It doesn't hurt them, but it doesn't help them either. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, COVID impact. So you saw how we build a portfolio. And now as a fund manager, I think about COVID all the time. We talk to other fund managers, continue, continuously discuss what's happening. And uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's one word right now is uncertainty. We just don't know where we're going to go. There are possible scenarios. Um, but there are risks, a lot of risks. There's a fiscal cliff risk if um, our politicians, our elected leaders, don't come up with a compromise and don't uh, provide additional support for the economy. We may have serious problems starting in this quarter. If they do extend uh, some unemployment benefits, if not all, uh, and they provide incentives for people to go back to work, um, that that should that should support the economy, but this is going to be a critical piece in the middle of a pandemic because we are very, very vulnerable right now. And uh, please uh, don't be fooled by the stock market. And I mean this with due res all due respect. I, I am not a stock market expert, but the stock market recovery feels too fast and too strong. Uh, I'm seriously concerned with valuations of all these companies because the fundamentals uh, are, are concerning. It's very, also something important to keep in mind, COVID, uh, separated the winners and the losers. I understand why Amazon stock is going through the roof. Its business has gotten so much better. I understand why a Zoom stock is going up. The business is so much better. But there are many other companies whose stock should not be trading where it is, in my opinion. Again, I don't give any advice. I'm just saying that I, I would I would be cautious right now with what has happened um, with that super fast uh, paper recovery. The fundamentals are still very concerning. Uh, many businesses just will not open, They'll and, and many tenants will default, downsize, and vacate. Uh, more than 50% of all um, restaurants and other small businesses are projected to fail as a result of COVID. they just never going to get back to where they were before. So it's going to hurt a number of commercial um, assets. And we don't know, there may be differentiation, where they are, what type, so on and so forth. Hard to say, a lot of unknown, but releasing rates are likely to, to come down. Um, many assets will have debt, debt challenges. Uh, there was a recent publication that came out that the uh, uh, default or delinquency rate on uh, commercial mortgages shot up in June re relative to April. So the, the delinquencies on commercial assets are significant. Many banks are granting forbearances, which is fine, uh, but they will ru run out probably uh, in late Q3. And then Q4, we may see some of that um, uh, real problems hitting the, uh, the, the economy. So highly leveraged assets uh, may not be able to service the debts. Uh, mortgage temporary forbearance will run out, as I mentioned. Liquidity pain, they'll run out of cash. And what do they do then? Uh, it's a very possible scenario. They just can't pay. The tenants don't pay. They can't service the debt. At some point, uh, they they will be in a workout or foreclosure type of situation. So valuations will be set on some of these assets later on. And our fund is very opportunistic. We're looking at some of these deals, but we don't want to just buy dysfunctional um, shopping plaza. We want to find what do we do with it? If it's a dysfunctional hotel, is this a conversion project? So it's, it, it has to have a good value at plan. If there's no plan, and not a competent operator, you can't even start the discussion. But the point is, it, uh, we expect some level of um, more uh, greater opportunities coming to the market uh, in, the, in the second, um, in the fourth quarter, in the second half of the year, later second half. And again, fall 2020 uh, and beyond. Um, and uh, we still don't know what's going to happen with the residential. Just the one common residential. Residential 
affordable range is on fire everywhere in the country, as crazy as it sounds. The reason it's on fire is because interest rates were cut, cut uh, so affordability shut through the roof, supply very limited. Many people are not selling their houses. They don't want to have people visiting them during the COVID. Supply low, interest rates um, low, they, they, they're boosting the demand uh, and, afford, and people are gravitating to affordable housing. So affordable housing is on fire. Instead of falling down, it's up uh, anywhere from 10 to 15% pre-COVID to post-COVID. That's what's happening right now. But that's a temporary thing. I, I think the, the, the residential real estate has significant risks ahead and uh, we might see um, some level of um, uh, serious issues past election. Once election is over, politicians don't need to compromise as much. It will be in early 2021. Uh, there's a possibility of some level of correction and I would, I would put a word of caution. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with residential real estate. Love the sector. Just got to be realistic about it. Um, as economy uh, settles down with an employment rate probably, you know, eight, nine, ten percent after we see a reasonable recovery, we'll be in a significant recession. So my point is, um, uh, be very kind of mindful of what's happening. Uh, it's not all um, all great news. Plenty of risks ahead. So again, unemployment numbers um, are improving, but and they're, they're running better than originally projected, uh, but there's still significant risk. Government action continues to be extraordinary uh, beyond anything we've seen in the past. Uh, don't go, the, Warren Buffett says, don't bet, don't bet against America. I agree with him. Don't bet against Fed. Fed has been absolutely uh, uh, as flexible, as creative, and as aggressive to create liquidity, to buy fallen angels. Fallen angels are the companies whose bonds <coughs> have been downgraded into junk bond territory, but they're strategically important. So they're buying mortgage-backed securities, US treasuries, <coughs> excuse me, um, corporate debt, they, they've launched Main Street Lending Facility, so uh, the sky's the limit. I, I just read an article today, um, where, where's the end? There is no end. They, they, they increase the, the balance sheet by $3 trillion, they can increase by another three. They, there's no, there's no, they can do whatever they, they, they feel is necessary to support the economy. And then you got the government uh, stimulus packages that provide um, uh, cash in people's hands and, um, uh, the PVP program, the unemployment benefits, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> All of this is very supportive. Um, just keep in mind that certain sectors are just in deep distress, and I don't expect any serious recovery. Uh, in retail, there might be uh, sort of separations between the, the winners and the losers. So certain retail assets will do just fine. Some other ones will go completely out of business. In hospitality, Similar concept. Some of them will get converted to affordable housing, they'll, they'll be fine, and some will persevere and, and wait until uh, recovery, and some will die off completely. Just be very mindful what you're investing into and the impact. So, what's the plan of action now? So, the fund manager, I sit here and I think about this uh, do we invest now? Do we wait for better deals? And the answer uh, uh, to the question is all of the above. Uh, we just don't know where things are going to go. So, we need to find good deals today. Uh, we need to find good deals in the future. Hopefully they're better than today, but if they're not better than today, then the deals we invest in now will look pretty good. So uh, that's the whole game is to find uh, opportunities today. You, you have to be prudent and you have to be uh, very selective in what you invest in, but you can invest in today. I'll give you an example of the Riverbend deal. Very successful, we just found it, we love it. Um, uh, we invested in, into another deal, just give you an example, from another fund, we have Tempo Opportunity and Tempo Growth. We invested in a portfolio of 94 single family houses in Mobile, Alabama, because it's a great cash flow portfolio. Different focus. That fund is focused on more of income and some growth. This one is focused on growth. So there are interesting opportunities. And what's, what, 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 what's uh, fascinating uh, is that you, you can, you need to focus on your strategy. If your strategy is income, Pick the income assets, that's what we do. The reason we like that portfolio, virtually all of it was Section 8. 
Some people you know, thought it was bad. I thought it was great. The government guarantees your payment. Uh, the cash flow on that portfolio is in the, in the teens. So from that perspective, we'll take it. Um, but it wouldn't be a good match for the growth fund because we don't care about the cash flow. We could invest it, but I would rather see value at and, and a higher rate of return. Um, so anyway, be prepared to invest now and be prepared to invest uh, later. Uh, you could use dollar cost average. You can invest some money now and some money in six months or three months, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, and uh, uh, again, if you invest now and the market stabilizes ahead of, of schedule, hey, the current investments will look like you know, you've know you done really well. A couple of words about Tempo Growth Fund. Again, it's a growth focused. Uh, so one comment people ask, you know, how do I... How, do, how does target return connect to the preferred return? It's a common question with all the funds. You see preferred return and then you see target. Generally target is above preferred return because the target return is a combination of preferred return plus performance split. In our case, um, once investors get 8% for every dollar, we have um, an additional income. Uh, investors either get 80% or 70, depending on the class of units. And um, uh, Generally speaking, on a closed-ended funds, the waterfall like works like this. Because it's a growth fund, we can't distribute 8% per year. So don't be fooled. When you see preferred return, it doesn't mean you're going to get distributions of, of that amount. You can, if it's an income fund, then you have preferred return. You can get the preferred return as distribution. But on a growth fund, you don't. What you get is you get a cumulative pref that just compounds. Sorry, it doesn't compound. It accumulates from a year to a year. So if you got no distributions for five years, Five years down the road, eight times five is 40%. Uh, you're entitled to receive the preferred return ahead of any performance split. So the fund uh, manager can't get any performance incentives uh, until they meet your PREF. And generally speaking, uh, the waterfall works as following. Investors get all their PREF. It has to be caught up to, uh, to the full cumulative PREF, then the return of capital. So if you invested, an example, 100,000 bucks, five years down the road, you got to get your 40,000 bucks in, in preferred return. You got to get your 100,000 bucks back, return of capital. Then what's left gets split 80-20 or 70-30, say 70-30. So say there was another um, $100,000 available of, uh, per your share of the fund, then you would get another $70,000 of a... Um, preferred return your portion of the of the sorry not preferred your portion of the performance split so total between the uh performance split and then the preferred return in this example you would get 110,000 you get your 70 and you get your 40 and 110 and you invested 100 what does it come up to be it comes up to be a great return um but this is a pure example um uh but uh, the total return is a function of those two. I hope you understand how it works. It's PREF plus the performance split um, after full return of capital. Distribution. So fund like this has no initial distributions. Very important to know uh, when you're investing, are there going to be distributions? Are they quarterly? Are they monthly? In this fund, no distributions. We'll distribute uh, ad hoc when we have projects like life cycle. As we make investments, we get to an exit point. Um, the uh, uh, we will start returning capital or distributing income when we have it. A couple of other slides, uh, slides I'm almost done. I apologize for the, uh, for the length. So pro, uh, uh, pros and cons of investing in a uh, growth fund like Tempo Growth Fund. Many other funds have very similar dynamics. This should help you understand how closed-ended funds work. So we, we, we have institutional level preferred return and a split. Uh, and give you an example, what is an institutional level? So 8 pref and 70-30 over 8 or 80-20 over 8 is that. It's a good number. I've seen plenty of funds that will pay you 6 pref and then they'll give you 50-50 over 6. Or 8 pref and then 50-50 over 8. Though I'm not saying anything wrong with those funds. It's just not an institutional level. It's more of a mom and pop level. You want to see a split in that 70-30, 80-20 range uh, to investors versus 50-50 where the sponsor makes, you know, bigger portion of, well, it's not bigger, but it's a significantly, it's, it's bigger than 70-30. So um, that's that. The the projected target, uh, this fund has 12 to 18% target. Uh, annualized, it's tax efficient. Again, the depreciation benefits, if you can use IRAs, don't care. And most of the return will come in the form of capital gains, which 
per works perfectly well for IRAs. Uh, IRAs love interest income and they love capital gains. What they don't like um, is uh, you know leveraged return, which can cause you a bit, um, or income from uh, operating companies that could be subject to you a bit. It's another discussion, but capital gains is a perfectly good match for IRAs. Uh, potentially strong returns based on the value of strategy, good management, good sponsors, good projects. Uh, diversification, one of the key benefits. An IRA friendly with no leverage on the fund level. Some of the uh, cons, just something to keep in mind, not necessarily bad things, just um, caveats. No cash distributions in the early years. Uh, no liquidity. Uh, capital is invested for the life of the fund. Um, you can't come in in the middle of the fund and say, hey, I need redemption. Well, how do we get redemption when the money is invested in the project? Unless somebody steps into your shoes. It's possible to do, maybe be able to find another investor, but technically there is no formal redemption mechanism. Uh, no reinvestment of distributions. When the money starts coming back, you'll have to take the money back. Um, not a catastrophic problem. At that point, there may be a 2.0 version of the fund, or you may choose to do whatever you like with the money. Fund is projected to, to take five to seven years, could be longer or shorter. So some investments will, will cycle back a whole lot faster. Distressed commercial mortgages will not take five years. They'll get foreclosed and liquidated within a couple of years typically. Even in New York, it could be two and a half, three years, but it's not a five to seven year time horizon. On the other side, value add projects uh, could take five to seven years. Uh, if the market conditions are not great, it's possible that the fund would extend the exit on those assets until there's favorable mar market conditions. And also, closed ended funds work on committed capital, known as pledges or subscriptions and capital calls. So capital calls just means, um, so let me start back. The pledge or commitment means I want to invest a quarter million dollars. Great, wonderful. But we don't need the money immediately. Uh, we need the money when we have deals. So your pledge uh, is such that you're committing to invest, but we'll issue capital call when we're ready to take the money. And generally speaking, the money don't sit too long on the sidelines. We've had pretty good experience but it may be on the sidelines for a month, for a few weeks, until we're ready to take in the money. So capital call is just a request to pull in the money when we have a deal. What we don't want to do is get the money in and start paying 8% preferred return. Most funds operate the same way. It's a pledge and capital call when there is a deal. That's it. You can find me at bigmikefund.com. You can schedule time to chat via uh, bigmikecall.com. Uh, it's a, a Calendly link. It'll set up a Zoom and happy to chat. Appreciate your time. I hope it wasn't too boring and I hope you uh, learned something from the presentation. Hey Mike, thanks a lot. I'm gonna uh, take the screen back and put both of our contact info on there so that uh, people can see that. And if I can find it, yes I can. And then we'll answer a couple questions and, uh, and kind of go on about our way. So. Sounds good. Okay. Yep, we are running a little over time, so we probably will not answer all these questions. However, I will say to everybody that a lot of these are specific to Mike, so I will make sure that Mike gets them and you'll respond to them via email probably, Mike, yeah? Something like that? Okay, great. Yes. So you will get your question answered even if we don't talk about it here on the presentation, uh, And uh, but it may come in, uh, via email. Okay, so first question, uh, is there custodian insurance for the investor? What other protections there? So that's actually an excellent question, right? So, and this happens in, in all asset classes. I mentioned that uninvested cash is FDIC insured. That's generally speaking the cover if the bank fails. Um, but the IRS does allow IRAs to uh, procure insurance and to protect their investment. But it really depends on the investment type, right? So if your IRA buys a piece of real estate, a single family rental, it can buy whatever level of insurance you, the account holder, think is appropriate to, to cover yourself. Um, in a private equity investment, that that is probably not possible. I'm not ever going to say that any insurance product is not possible because, <laughs> because there have been some odd ones. Um, but very unlikely that you would get somebody to insure an investment like that. So in, in the second part of the question, what are your protections there? You know, m most often it's, it's doing good due diligence up front and finding out exactly who the people you're working with and what the what the downside is for you know in case the investment doesn't go as planned et cetera, et cetera. so there is risk and i will say this in terms of iras because people have a misperception about it sometimes it is neither 
riskier nor less risky to invest your IRA funds. It really, the, the risk is the same and it's based on the asset type and the particular investment and that kind of thing. So yes, there are ways to protect yourself with certain assets, but the, the key protection is due diligence up front, at, at least in this type of thing that we're talking about today. Um, excellent question. Uh, there's a question about what, is, and this one's for you, Mike, what, what is the minimum to invest? Well, it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars in this fund. Technically, uh, we've made exceptions. Um, if we jump on a call, and I see that you are a great investor, competent, uh, ask great questions, we can we can reduce it. Uh, we've taken as low as a hundred. Uh, technically, it's it's two fifty, um, but you know we'll make an exception if 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 you know we feel like it's a good it's a good match. Okay. Uh... One question is all the capital uh, for the fund, is it, is it raised through IRA channels? I, I happen to know that it's not. So there's IRA and non-IRA money. Correct. So Mike, on the, on the non-IRA money, how do the taxes affect the appreciation slash distributions? So the fund is very tax efficient because it passes through a lot of depreciation. Uh, we have a number of non-IRA investors um, and they will enjoy, if they can use depreciation. Uh, I, I don't have the exact figure of, you know, to what degree depreciation will, will be, but it'll be significant because we're investing in these projects with segregation started, accelerated depreciation and so on. Um, whatever income we're going to get is going to get shielded through the depreciation easily uh, on these projects. So. There should be no taxation for a significant portion of the um, uh, of a life cycle, and most of the taxation will come in on the back end when we start uh, exiting the assets, um, and most of them will be capital gains on the back end. Uh, there will be some income on the way as the value of strategy is executed and the asset starts cash flowing, uh, but beyond that, it's just capital gains uh, on the back end. Okay. See, I'm going to select this. How, how does fund? How does the fund decide to diversify the risk, considering it invests in quadrants two and four? Well, great question. Uh, we, we're always looking for downside protection. So, as much as we can, we're thinking, uh, as I said, the trust commercial debt. We're in a first lien position. It, it's got that downside protection. It just got naturally. Um, when we invest in value add projects, like I mentioned, I showed you a couple of these value add. Um, uh, multi-family. We know the sponsor well. Uh, we try to understand what's the risk of um, uh, vacancy increasing, uh, what are the kind of demographics of the area, the trends, and then uh, look through what's the break-even um, uh, point. So we go, we, we do through, go through a number of underwriting steps to understand um, what happens in different uh, scenarios. Uh, again, asset class selection, um, and a number of other, uh, both asset level, sponsor level um, reviews to be comfortable. Nothing is risk free, um, but if these are um, uh, existing uh, uh, multifamily with incremental, it's what we're trying to do instead of going to aggressive new construction, we'd rather take incremental improvements. Uh, on a self storage side, when we do those, it's feasibility study, um, what the area looks like, what the competition looks like. Uh, if the numbers work well and there's a good sponsor, uh, we know how these things work. I mean, they lease up about 2% a month. There's a pretty steady, uh, mathematically predictable um, uh, models and typically use uh, uh, very experienced um, operators um, uh, like CubeSmart could be running a facility. So. Those are sort of the steps to create downside protection. Um, the uh, the growth fund and the value strategy itself has risks. So the quadrant four deals are your development redevelopment deals, and we absolutely understand that they're quadrant four, and we uh, we track them as quadrant four. Um, we would love to have 60, you know, 70 percent of the fund in quadrant two, maybe 30 in the quadrant um, four. Um, but we're adjusting for risk. We better have better uh, projected risk adjusted ROI in quadrant four and the quadrant two. Otherwise, you know, well, why invest? So it's really investment by investment uh, decisions. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, if we find some good, but we feel it's a little bit borderline and falls in quadrant four. By the way, it's not hard quadrant two or hard quadrant four. Some deals are borderline. 
uh, we'll just make a smaller investment. I mean, decision, uh, we're trying to, to do nothing less than 500,000, but we can, you know, if we feel like it's a good addition, just a little bit more speculative. So from a model perspective, you know, you know we can get two thirds in quadrant two and one third in quadrant four, you know, not guaranteed, but that's, you know, that's what um, uh, the, the general objective. Uh, and we would like to get um, even quadrant four deals Again, conversion of an old Ramada to affordable housing. It feels pretty, pretty good thesis. It, it's a good approach. Uh, it, it feels like upon completion of the work, the risk will be reduced and it, it will not be uh, all quadrant four. But at a time of a conversion, it's a riskier project and um, we'll manage. I mean, if we have a couple of them, we feel we're getting overexposed, we shut off the, the faucet, we don't do any more. I mean, that's the whole idea. Um, not only you look at great, uh, opportunities, but how do they fit in your portfolio? If something looks great, but we're already overexposed in quadrant four, and we have similar deals, we're going to have to pass. It's just, you know, it, it's not good for us at that time because we have too much exposure to that. And it's, a, by the way, it's a reality of life. You make a couple of investments and you see a better one and it's like, I want to do that one, but you already have so much in that. Do you really want to take more exposure to that? So that, that's, that's, that, that's how I think. Hey, Mike, I'm going to, so, I appreciate the questions that we have, and and I think that we're at a place where I'm going to need to to send those to you. They're, they're very specific, and I, I appreciate them being sent in. But I wanted to end with just one one that's a little more general, just because I I'm kind of curious about it as well, and I know that some of our uh, attendees would be. So I know that you were not always managing these funds and things like that. You were a real estate investor before that. So how do you see the the, the difference for you between kind of just your regular real estate investing as an individual versus the your mindset when you're investing for the fund? Is it significantly different or did you take the, the tools from one to the other? How, how do those compare? So it's a great question. Um, it's a natural progression. So I started a career in the software, spent almost 15 years and I sort of overlapped, you know, was doing a real estate part-time from 2000 till 2009 and still doing software uh, as an executive in various companies. Um, it just happened naturally. I, I started buying real estate here in New York and I, I, I thought it was great. It had you know, all the benefits, the leverage. And, and um, as I saw uh, investments generate great returns for me personally, I thought, hey, I like this. I mean, I could do it for other people. And, and then... Um, it progressed, and in 2009, I was burned out from the um, software industry. So the, the switch was a natural, but is a different thinking. It's, it's, it's a same basic thinking. Is this a good deal? Why is it a good deal? Um, what are the onsite protection? It's the same same thinking. Everything that I've invested in, I've asked myself those questions. Not not all investments are perfect, but uh, it helps you avoid. Um, errors and mistakes so the only thing that has changed is as as i become a fund manager i, I get to uh, manage more and more money um it's a bigger bigger dollar amounts so I've gravitated from investments of certain size to bigger investments and uh, as i grew my personal portfolio it's the same exercise you at some point you gravitate to a fewer bigger deals uh so that's the progression uh, is from smaller deals matching the size of your portfolio to a few or bigger deals, um, uh, better return on time and uh, uh, using strength in numbers. Uh, we, we often uh, pull um, uh, sort of negotiating power with other funds, uh, kind of sister and brother funds where we negotiate with a sponsor. We don't want to write a, a check for the whole investment but we can write the check for 50% and somebody else can write the check for 50% and strength in numbers, we negotiate a better deal. So what happens is as, as uh, I start managing more and more money, I've been able to get better deals for uh, our funds and my own funds because of the economy of scale. Does that make sense? It does, it does. Well, Mike Slavik, thank you very much for joining me today. It was good to see you and uh, I appreciate you. your insights. Thank you kindly. Uh, everybody, everybody, appreciate your time and attention and uh, enjoy. Uh, I've been working with Clay for a long time. He's a super pro and uh, you'd be in great hands with, with Clay. <laughs>
Thanks, Mike. Okay, so our contact information is up on the screen. I hope you wrote that down. If you, if you have any other questions, we're happy. Either one of us are happy to uh, respond to you if you have questions or just want to talk strategies or things like that. So please feel free to use us as a resource. I really do appreciate you spending some time with us today, and uh, you know, hopefully it was helpful for you. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and we will see you on the next broadcast. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Clay.